And I was looking for something that was kind of like Erlang, but it was also fast, it was low latency. Uh, there was something coming out of Foundation DB that had a nice little actor framework they built. Unfortunately, it was acquired by a large corporate uh, named after a fruit. Uh, and this large corporate named after a fruit decided not to make it open source, so uh, I was then left hunting for another actor framework, and I stumbled across the Pony programming language, which at the time was very much in research at uh, ICL in London, uh, Imperial College, by a guy called Sylvan Klebsch and his team uh, in West London. Um, Sylvan is an absolute genius, as I've come to discover. Um, so here's what we're going to cover today. Uh, we're going to cover the, the Pony language features. Uh, we're going to cover uh, Pony reference capabilities, which I think is the most interesting aspect of Pony. It's what gives the runtime its, um, its secret sauce. So we're going to look through the actors, the scheduler, the garbage collector. Then we're going to see if you actually listen to any of that. We're going to have a little quiz. Uh, and see if you understand how Pony works based on the first half of the talk. Then we're going to do a little bit of benchmarks to see how Pony compares to other languages. And then we're going to look at what I've been working on uh, in my spare time, which is uh, porting Pony to the MIPS platform, uh, which we're going to do a demo of today. It's not quite finished, but it's good enough to show you how Pony can scale from where it's really been designed to operate, which is in banks, on trading systems, and in large-scale uh, platforms, but it can also scale down onto a matchbox-side device where the full platform is available to you. Not quite on the matchbox. It works fine on a Raspberry Pi. And then we're going to look at where Pony's going in the future, if that makes sense. OK. So fast safe actors that don't or won't, most, uh, don't, won't crash mostly. Pony's a little bit different to most actor models if you've used ACA or if you've used Erlang, uh, where they give you very good isolation guarantees, but um, they don't actually protect you from a lot of the things that can happen or go bump in the night in production. Uh, Pony's a little bit different in that it will try and detect what you can do that's bad in production at compile time to prevent you writing code that might do something wrong in production. So it's a very, very different philosophy in terms of how it's built and the programming facilities it gives you to contend with these kinds of things. Uh, that's uh, perhaps the most interesting thing to acquire if you write production systems. It also means it's a little bit different to learn. So we're going to focus on reference capabilities quite a lot. That's the thing that's the most different, the most challenging to learn when you're learning the language, if that makes sense. So the actor model, invented by Carl Hewitt in 1973. That's over 40 years ago. It wasn't useful for about 10 years until a formalism was put behind it by Gulaga. Uh, that's 30 years ago. Uh, then there was a small little language from a crazy telco company out of Sweden, which gave us Erlang OTP, probably the world's most loved or hated um, actor model, depending on your persuasion. Um, and then there's Pony. This is Sylvan Klebsch, the, uh, the genius behind Pony, when he met uh, Joe Armstrong at CodeMesh earlier last week in London. Um, so a lot of uh, the credit for, for Pony goes directly to Sylvan. A lot of the inf inspiration for design behind it actually comes from the Erlang philosophy of let it crash. The big difference being that Pony is really trying to let it crash before you actually run the system. So it's looking and analyzing your code uh, to, to, to make sure that you've got stable uh, production systems as a result. So if there's a data race in your code, it won't compile. It will complain at you, which is pretty unique. Um, how many of you here have run or operate production systems? <laughs> Hands up. How many of you like sp staying up late at night tracing weird race conditions? <laughs> None of us. So stuff like this is really cool. Um, and that's why I think everyone should learn a little bit about it. Um, so actors, composable concurrency. It's love, right? Awesome. OK. So let's go straight into the language features. Um, most of these should be fairly familiar with most folk in the JVM community or in .NET. Uh, some of them, as we move on to reference capabilities, got a little bit different. So we're going to move through this quite quickly. If anyone has any questions, please throw up your hand or just throw in a question as we're moving through it. Don't be shy. Um, and then we move on to the interesting bits. OK, so variables and fields. Um, single assignment. If you use Erlang, you'll notice that most variables or all variables are assigned once and once only. So they're not mutable. It's the same in um, Pony if you use a let expression. 
So here we're uh, assigning an, a 64-bit assigned integer value of 1 to the variable single assignment. We also have regular references. So if you're used to the JVM, you're used to a regular a variable assignment. This is exactly the same thing. We're making multiple assignments here, a Boolean true, which we can change later. We also have an embeddable uh, variable type, which you'll find in classes or structures. And that is designed to avoid pointer interactions. So if you're trying to map a C-like structure into Pony, embed becomes very powerful and useful. If you use the array type in Pony, for example, the array built-in type, uh, you will have a pointer interaction that can create problems with those uh, kind of native mappings. Um, you have those three basic uh, built-in types. Expressions in Pony have absolutely no precedence whatsoever. Um, so, for example, in Java, C, or C++, if I have the variable A assigned to 1, the variable B assigned to 2, and the variable C assigned to 3, is long x A plus B times C, does it mean 7 or 9? Who thinks it's going to be 7? Who thinks it's going to be 9? No one's committed to giving an answer. Now, will we get the same answer if we, if we try and calculate the same results in Erlang? Will it be 7 or 9? Or how about small talk? Is it the same or different? And Or Python? You don't know, do you, offhand? And I can't remember offhand. But Pony solves this by not allowing you to uh, take advantage of precedence. You must declare and use parentheses to provide the precedence to the compiler. It's a very, very simple language uh, design choice. But it means that there's no cognitive overhead when you're reading Pony code that has mathematical expressions. The precedence is directly obvious. There's also no widening cast in Pony. So if you want to cast something, whether to widen it or otherwise, you have to use a cast operation. Okay? It's really, really simple to read code. And simple to read code is simple to understand and tends to be less buggy than um, complex code. Um, who's ever gotten precedence wrong in a complex Java program who's done you know, financial trading or gambling systems? I get it wrong a lot. Maybe I'm lazy, I don't know, but maybe I'm just not careful enough. But that's pretty cool. Um, statements are expressions. This is another interesting change. So anywhere where you can have a, a literal value, you can have an expression in Pony. So this construction, for example, to assign the value to x, again assigned 64-bit integer, uh, we're now using a, an if expression to calculate the value. Okay, so that's quite powerful to reduce the complexity of our code. A, f a for loop is an expression in Pony. So we can assign the result of this uh, for expression to the variable x in the second example. Okay? Can anyone tell me what this value is? What is the value of x at the end? Anyone hazard a guess? So if anyone is red or green colorblind, th the answer mightn't be obvious. It's max exclusive. So it's A plus, A being, say, 1. That would be 10, right? OK. Errors. Uh, Pony's rather strict when it comes to errors and, and rather interesting. So errors in, in Pony have no runtime errors, though. So there's no state or data attached to errors. You either error or you don't. It's quite simple. And you can control errors using a try else end block. So in this case, if this happened to throw in a, a, an error, we could handle it in the else block, or we could decide to rethrow it. Okay, in this case, we're handling and we're swallowing the error by printing out a message. Um, we can decide not to handle an error. So in this case, we've got a function bad, which just throws an error. Um, we're cascading this to the function do it, which calls bad, and we're not handling it. We're deciding to just throw it up. Uh, and then in create, then we have to handle it. Um, because constructors in Pony aren't allowed to cascade errors. We call these partial functions, uh, by the way. So that question mark operator at the end of that function uh, declaration is signifying that this may throw an error. And that's all we know. We don't know what type of error it is. There's no classification to it. Again, this may cause some issues when you're integrating with native code. But if anyone's ever done C systems programming, Clearly, we integrate with C. You can simply defer the error until you've created the object and return some error descriptor or error class to describe what class of error it was, if you're interested. Does that make sense? So it's pretty simple. And we have Erlang-style pattern matching. So who here likes uh, functional programming languages? 
oh, this is good, at least half the audience. We only need to convert the, the half at the back, except for the guy in the black t-shirt. He's awesome. Um, this is pretty verbose. Um, this is how you would do the same in Pony. So we have a match expression, and this match expression allows us to match on various arguments. We also have tuples, so when you see parentheses separated by commas, that's a tuple in Pony. Um, and we have a much more concise um, way to process complex expressions. Make sense? So here's an example of using a wildcard. If you've used Erlang, you know there's sometimes in a structure you don't care about some of the internal structures. You can say, look, if I get this internal structure, I don't care. You can use a wildcard to swap that out. So that's what we're doing there. And we have algebraic expressions. So we can define atoms called primitives and pony, red, green, and blue, and then we can union them together as a color type. So we're using a type alias color, which is either red or green or blue. So again, using parentheses separated by a pipe operation, you've got the ability to union types where it makes sense. A colored thing is some string identifying a thing and a color, and so we're using comma to create tuples. And we've got a union of uh, a union and a tuple uh, that is a maybe colored thing, which can be either a colored thing or none. Um, the other algebraic type you'll see is intersection. You typically see it in generics, which we won't cover today. So we're using the ampersand or intersection operator to identify that the key in this generic map must be both hashable and comparable, for example. Um, in generics, you'll see reference capabilities. That's this box um, reference. Uh, which we'll get onto when we cover reference ca capabilities a little bit later. You typically don't see this in non-generic code. Pony has sensible defaults. That means you don't see reference capabilities a lot with non-generic code. Okay. So, given a tuple, then we can destructure and we can manipulate it in, in the usual way. So, if you're familiar with Erlang or Elixir, you can define a tuple. You can construct it. You can access members within the tuple. So, we're using an index. Uh, to access the member, we can access them by name as well, and we can then destructure them out into types as well. Make sense? It's fairly simple. Okay. So primitives, there's actually a number of different types. All the bu built-in uh, kind of integers, signed or unsigned, are all primitives. Uh, so all the built-in types are a special kind of uh, compiler intrinsic primitive. You can use, you can add functions or stateless functions to primitives, so you can package collections of a kind of utility code into a primitive uh, class. Um, and you can union them together, which is where you'll typically use them as a, an enumeration. Okay. We have traits. So this offers you nominal subtyping. They can't have fields, but they may have default uh, implementations. For those familiar with Scala, they're kind of similar. We have interfaces. So this gives you structural subtyping. So again, they can't have fields, and they may have default implementations. So in this case, we have the interface real, for example, and the interface pair. So anything that has an add operation uh, from real uh, can be overloaded and then uh, used in the usual way. So we can overload and use the, um, let me go back in here. We can just add those two pairs together. Make sense? Anyone's used to um, structural subtyping, this should be fairly natural to use. Um, so you can inherit traits explicitly or implicitly. If you inherit them explicitly, you benefit from the default implementations. If you don't, you don't. Um, they have constructors, and constructors must initialize all fields. And you'll find that's common throughout Pony, that when you're constructing a thing, they cannot err. You either completely, I uh, completely construct the object, or you don't construct the object at all. The compiler will complain. Um, so here's an example. Here's a class Wombat which has a name and a hunger level, and we can construct it by using a new create, so the new keyword signifies that it's a constructor. In this case, we're passing in a string. And we can have as many as constructors as we want, so if we have a hungry wombat, we can pass in uh, the name of the wombat and specify how hungry it is, defaulting to it's not very hungry at all um, in this case. And we have inheritance. So in this case, we're explicitly inherit inheriting from named. And uh, that name will, uh, we're overriding the name here uh, to Sylvan. There's no multiple inheritance in Pony at all. It's a flat type system. 
you can have multiple traits, multiple interfaces. Okay. Uh, functions. So whenever you see the fun keyword, you're defining a function. So here we have the fun hunger, which returns the hunger level, and we have a fun uh, set hunger, which uh, updates the level based on the parameter passed in. You'll notice again, we're starting to see uh, reference types. So in this case, we're setting the default reference capability to box, which I haven't explained yet. And here we're setting the return reference capabil or the capability to ref. We need to do that in Pony because ref signifies a mutable, uh, mutable access and we're changing hunger levels. So we need to specify that that's a ref. If we specify that as a val or box type function, then we wouldn't be able to update that value. Okay? Uh, another interesting thing in Pony is assignment is not assignment at all. It's a destructive read operation. So when we're assigning A to B to A here in this example, we're assigning the current value of A to B, but the old value of B to A because we're chaining that together. So that's a swap operation in Pony. You don't need temporary variables when you have destructive read. That's pretty cool. Um, native integration. So who here uses or abuses Twitter? I'm in, I think, the abuser category with Jamie Allen here. I think Roland's a user. I'm not sure if Sergey's a, a user or abuser. User, okay, I'm an abuser. Jamie's an abuser, so even. Uh, if you want to integrate with native code in Pony, you use the at operator. So if you want to call sprintf from libc, then you just at sprintf. You need to specify the return type, so sprintf returns a 32-bit signed integer. Uh, but that's, that's it, you're done. You don't have to write any stub code, you don't need to swig interfaces. You basically just integrated with C. It's that simple. There's no skeleton or glue code that needs to be written whatsoever. And that is absolutely amazing. If you've uh, integrated uh, native code with Java, you've just stuck with JNI. If you've integrated with Erlang, you've got NIFs or BIFs. You need to write a lot of horrible wrapper code uh, to integrate with native code. And Pony, you just stick an at on it, and you're done. So in the case of uh, this actor, suck it and see, if we put the at on it, it means when we call Pony with the minus L attribute, it will compile code, and it will generate a header for us so that we can actually call that Pony code from C. So again, just at it if you want to integrate with native code. And it's... We'll get on to structs next. Uh, so uh, what happens if we have a native structure and we want to integrate those uh, with Pony? So here's term iOS, for example. So if you're um, playing with a lot of hardware or Bluetooth serial or some serial device, you might want to map this into Pony. How would that look? Well, it's actually fairly easy to take a native C structure and define it in Pony. We use the struct type in Pony, and we just map in uh, the flags. You'll notice here we're using embed because we want to avoid pointer indirection on that array in the struct. So let's go back. So we can see we've got our array of control characters, and clearly we don't want a pointer indirection uh, there, so we use embed. So we can use uh, regular uh, Pony uh, kind of classes add our variables and just map them to underlying types. There's some extra support I haven't shown for uh, possibly null types because no, uh, Pony doesn't have the concept of null, so it can't uh, give you a null pointer exception. But there are cases when you're integrating with C code that you need to integrate with null, so you use a maybe essentially. So it may be null, and you can check whether it's null or not. And that's how we work around that. Uh, but using structs, maybe, and um, you know, the, the built-in types that are in Pony is, is the easiest way to integrate uh, native code into Pony when you have complex structures. And this will work for arbitrary graphs of, of data as well. So it's a, it's a very, very complete implementation. Um, oh, we were there already. And we have delegates. So if you, you find that you're uh, writing code and you want to keep it modular, you can reuse implementations. So this is kind of a mix-in in Pony. You just uh, define a bunch of uh, different types of wombats in this case. And now we can assign various wombat implementations based on runtime state or context, if that makes sense. So we have a drone wombat and a kung fu wombat that are assigned depending on the value of some not very random, random variable in this case, um, if that makes sense. Okay, so uh, the last and feature in Pony, and a lot of the, these uh, structures that you've already seen actually map down into an object data or a lambda, lambda internally, 
um, is lambda operations and object literals. These simply have an apply function. So anything with an apply uh, can be called as a lambda or used where an object literal or lambda would be used in Pony. Um, so if you want to pass around uh, code, uh, you can use lambdas or object literals to achieve that in a reasonably generic way. Um, it's LLVM based. Uh, th the big win for that is you can use LLDB or GDB if you're uh, familiar with them and uh, start debugging a mixed native and Pony executable. Um, the Pony code will also um, integrate seamlessly into that debug experience. So you can switch between debugging the Pony runtime and compiler itself and switch between uh, uh, Pony code um, in the same debugging session. That's just a big win compared to a lot of other environments where you need different debugging tools depending on, on what you're doing. Uh, it's a big time saver. Um, and because it's LLVM based, we can do a lot of cheating. So for example, if you happen to be porting Pony to some other language, which I am at the moment, you can pull out the LLVM intermediate representation. Uh, you can compile it to human readable or bit code, uh, to human readable assembly or bit code, and then start seeing how to get that code compiled for the particular architecture that you happen to be targeting. Uh, I wrote that as a hack, and I'm now using it seriously. So I wrote this a couple of months ago just because it was possible. Um, to bypass the code generator in Pony and, and do it via LLVM directly. I'm now using it seriously because I'm having problems on MIPS, which you'll see later in the demo. Um, and I'm using this to actually debug why the, the MIPS uh, code generation is going wrong. So something written as a joke has become a serious debugging aid. And you'll see why um, later. Um, okay, so that's, that's the language, that's what it offers to you as a programmer that you should be reasonably familiar with and it should be fairly easy to get up and running with. Uh, things get a little bit more interesting with generics, which are familiar uh, for anyone using generics and .NET or, or the JVM, but they're different in that they enforce reference capabilities. Um, and there's some other syntax sugar that we've skipped, uh, so we can have time to go through and look at uh, reference capabilities uh, specifically. And this really is the secret sauce of Pony. Uh, we've seen some references to it for now, but now we're going to go to it in some detail. So a reference capability uh, in Pony essentially indicates to the compiler a level of isolation of some reference to some other referent in the system. So uh, as, as something that is isolated, so an isolated string, you can only have one reference or alias to that string in the runtime. Uh, a value type, like a value type in another language or a mutable type, um, it can't be written, so it's safe to pass around because it's a read-only type. A reference type is mutable, so it can only be passed around safely under certain conditions. And uh, we need certain tools to be able to do that safely. A box type is locally immutable, so it's kind of like a const in C++. And we have a tag type, which has identity alone. In other words, we, don't, we can't read or write to it. Uh, but we can't invoke operations on it. Uh, and we have a transition type, um, which originally, when I discovered it, is the most difficult uh, uh, reference capability to wrap your head around, but most of you have used String Builder in Java. So when you're calling to String or String Builder in .NET, so when you're calling to String, you might create a String Builder, uh, create some String output format, and then you'll send it out as a string by calling to String on it. That's kind of exactly how we use the transition. You might create a, an array value. You will um, turn it into uh, a transition type. You will append various elements to the array, and then you'll return it as a sealed value if that makes sense. So that's how to think of using it, um, the underlying mathematics behind all of this and how they adapt to the runtime context is uh, complicated. Um, but that's the simplest way to get going is to find some analog in the language you're already using to get uh, comfortable running and using it. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, Pony uses these so that it can, at compile time, prove that your program is data race free. So there are certain operations you can perform on these or manipulations that the compiler can track for you that guarantees that the code generated from Pony is uh, data race free. And because Pony is lock free, it's also deadlock free um, in the resulting code. And that means the scheduler and the garbage collector can make certain assumptions because they're guaranteed and they're formally defined that allows it to be written uh, lock-free and allows it to be written uh, quite fast. So the GC, for example, has no stop the world pause at all. Um, nothing. So there's, there's no contention. There's no 10-minute wait uh, for uh, you to reach time to save point or anything like that that you get in the JVM. 
which means you don't have to phone Giltena and buy an Azul license to run your systems um, with reasonable performance guarantees at the long tail. That's kind of awesome. Um, what's interesting about reference capabilities is they don't specify what you can do, like in a file system. Do you have permission to read this file? They specify what you cannot do. Um, that takes a while to wrap your head around in practice. And they kind of um, they get tabulated into a matrix of, of these properties. So, for example, a reference type uh, doesn't deny global um, read or write access. It's a reference type. You can mutate the underlying state. Uh, it doesn't deny uh, local uh, read-write access either, so there's no limitations in terms of what you can do locally. But uh, a value type clearly denies write access both locally and globally, if that makes sense. Okay, so there's a table uh, of how these uh, different types relate to each other. The tag type uh, is opaque, so there's no read or write access. That should be fairly obvious. And it's just then box and TRN that take a, a little bit of time to get used to. ISO is an isolated type, so you can have one or only one reference to it in the runtime system. In other words, that's what we use for sending or message passing. Because there's only one reference to it, it can be safely sent between actors. Okay, does that make sense? So there's a subtype relationship across those capabilities. So from uh, the most denied, which is tag, to the least, or is it the other way around, which is ISO. And processing pony code at runtime, this is when you're writing generics, you spend most of your time actually looking back at the subtype graph and how uh, the reference capabilities uh, change based on the viewpoint of the code that you're trying to, trying to write. That's the only bit that's complex and difficult to learn. It takes six weeks before you get your head around it and actually start writing reasonable code against it. After that, it gets easier until you start using uh, some of the other features we'll come up to now. But um, after two or three months, it becomes reasonably natural to use. It's very, very difficult to explain because it's based on deny capabilities. It's a very different way uh, to thinking for some of us, unless you're a, a researcher in deny capabilities, it's probably fine. For most of the rest of us, once you've hit 40, these things are hard to learn. Um, so it's hard to learn. Um, so these properties are enforced by the compiler. So shared mutable data is hard. So in other words, reference capabilities or something with a reference capability shouldn't be shared. Right? It shouldn't be sendable. Right? Um, isolated data is safe, so it should be sendable. So Pony uh, uh, essentially tracks these to determine what can or can't be done or should or should not be done to preserve data race freedom. Uh, to guarantee that your programs are deadlock free, and it does this in the compiler. So it saves you a lot of uh, heavy lifting in your own code and bloat. You can write reasonably natural concurrent code. And the actor, actors being single threaded, this gives you a very, very composable environment. Um, that's the basics of what it offers in the compiler to ensure that you have a fairly easy time of it uh, at runtime. So a practical example or a visual example, so for an isolated type, we have actors Alice, Bob, Fred, Wilma, and Betty. So Alice has a, a, an isolated reference to some piece of shared data, and Bob has uh, no permissions, so a tag reference to a piece of shared data. Uh, that should be OK, because Bob has no read or write access to the shared data. Um, if Fred and Wilma have access to the shared data, and Fred is an ISO, but Wilma is writable, clearly that breaks the guarantees of isolation. So that is not OK. And in the case of Betty, if Betty has an isolated reference to the data and a readable reference, this is also not OK, because if she sends uh, the uh, isolated reference to some other actor, thereby consuming that reference, um, it's sti she still has a readable reference to it, so that wouldn't be safe. That would in introduce a data race. That is also not OK. Does that kind of make sense? Yes? No? Maybe? Maybe. So Fred can read Wilma when Wilma is writing, which is bad. And Betty could send ISO to Fred, but retain the readable reference, which is bad. Make sense? And um, So a value reference to an object. So Alice, Bob, and Fred are three actors. So if Alice has a val reference and Bob has readable references to a piece of shared data, that's OK. But if Fred has a writable reference to the shared data, that would not be OK. OK? Make sense?
If it's a ref, yes, and if it's public. So um, I think I skipped on the earlier slides, but if, if you mark a field with an underscore in its name, uh, you prepend it, then it's essentially private to that actor. But if you don't, it's public, so it's a public reference. So any actor could read a write to it. If it's a valid, it's immutable, then you shouldn't have a writable reference to it. So the compiler needs to track these uh, pieces of state. Uh, and it, do and it uh, does a pretty good job of that. Uh, for a tag, Alice and Bob uh, and Wilma, again, are actors, and they have access to some shared state. This is perfectly fine with a tag uh, to have readable or writable access, because a tag doesn't deny anything. Make sense? ISO pretty much denies everything except sending and receiving, if that makes sense. So by specifying these reference capabilities in your types in the code, Pony, the compiler, can track it to ensure that you're writing uh, data raise free code, essentially. That's the win that you get. There's no locks. Uh, the compiler proves it. It's got essentially a formula proving compiler. Uh, there's no mechanical proof for the entire um, uh, compiler yet, but I believe that's being worked on. Uh, there is a lot of work behind it. There's a lot of references in these slides. It's actually a reveal.js deck, so you can click on the links later. I'll post it uh, on Twitter, and you can click down into the underlying research. Um, okay. So consume hat and bang. So how do we operate on these? If I have two ISOs, uh, X and Y here, which are a something ISO, uh, I can't have two references to the something, can I? That would breach the, the guarantees of isolation. So in Pony, we have to ephemeralize the type. So we have to consume the isolated reference. So now there is no reference or alias backing that anymore. It's ephemeralized. Uh, and we use a hat operation for this, which you'll see in generic but not non-generic code like this. So W is essentially a something ISO hat until it's assigned to W, and then it becomes a something ISO again. Okay, so the compiler is tracking this underneath, making sure there's only ever one and only one reference to this particular something, or the underlying state for that particular something, if that makes sense. Okay. The bang operator, the bang operation, is the dual of an ephemeral type. So you'll often see in function signatures an ISO bang, and an ISO bang is a borrowed type. In other words, it's something that has come from a consumed type. And this is essentially where the mechanics of tracking isolated references in the compiler is done. And the programmer has to help a little bit in generic code by uh, indicating where ephemeral and borrowed types are actually used. In non-generic code, that's all defaulted away, so you typically don't see it. Uh, typically, but not always, there are cases when you have to deal with it. Um, okay. And then the last uh, operation is sometimes, uh, like in the string builder case, you need to hoist uh, the reference capability of a type. So the string type by default is a, is a value type, or all fields are value types. That's declared in the class as a default. In order to append to it, we need to make it a transition type. And that allows us to append values to it. And then when we send it on to someone else, we'll want to send it as a value type. So when you're constructing a, uh, a string or an array of things, um, you'll typically recover it to a transition type, you know, fill the data, and then seal it and send it off. And you do that when you send it somewhere. So that uh, recover expression essentially limits the immutability of, to that particular set of operations. Uh, that's how you use it. Um, understanding it is a, a slightly different kettle of fish. There's some other matrices inside there that guarantees how references interact with each other across, crass, uh, across classes uh, and across calls um, that you kind of need to learn as well. But you typically don't need to learn it in non-generic code, so I've entirely skipped it. Um, but this should give you a picture. Uh, if, y if you learn the 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 uh, the reference capabilities and how to learn consume and recover, that's 90% of the difficulty of learning Pony over a regular programming language. And as we've seen with the other language features, they're not much different to any other language you've used. Um, so they should be fairly easy to get up and running with. It's the reference capabilities that takes time to learn, time to master, and then time to actually use correctly. Um, but that's the small tax for having deadlock-free, data race free uh, code produced by the compiler. So in, in my perspective of not being up till 4 in the morning, uh, solving production issues, that's a massive win, um, at least for me. Um, so, uh, how does this translate to actors, schedulers, and the garbage collector, things that we all really care about when we're running complex systems? Well, 
Uh, so actors, they're like classes with behaviors. So for those using Alexa, Erlang, or Acker, you're already familiar with this. They're asynchronous. Um, they don't get executed immediately when you call them. They're scheduled for some point later uh, to be executed. So there's a notion of schedulers. And the pony scheduler environment is very similar to the Erlang scheduler environment, typically a scheduler per core. You can tune that. Um, so here's a simple actor implemented in Pony called Ping Pong. So we construct an actor. On construction, it will assign itself a reference to itself. And when you call either the ping or pong behavior, they will call the respective other behavior. So this will run uh, forever, essentially, or until you control C, the environment. Uh, does that make sense? It's pretty simple. Um, It's the same actor, so you have a this reference, but you don't have a this reference outside of that context, so that's why it's safe. If you have a reference to other actor, you need to get that from somewhere, so you've explicitly passed a reference. There's no magic way to get it. There's, um, you'd have to build a registry to uh, get access to references or something. So there's, you do have access to this, and there's something in generics that you'll contend with called viewpoint adaptation, where uh, the view of the reference capability of a type is dependent on both the reference and the origin. And that's where manipulation or writing good generic code becomes more complicated. You're more kind of full front uh, with the reference capability system. Um, if you send this outside the actor, you're sending, uh, you're essentially sending an ISO reference, but you're not doing that with a behavior that's asynchronous. Um, and it doesn't return a value or type, it returns this with the actor itself. And that allows you to chain behaviors, uh, which is something that's actually ridiculously interesting. And we'll see an example of that in a minute. Um, so when you're inside an actor, you can just think uh, inside the box. Because it runs, uh, you, can f you can consider it single threaded. There's no complex currency uh, primitives that you need to be dealing with. You just write natural, sensible code, and it does the right thing. Um, yes. Uh, yes. Um, absolutely yes. Uh, but it's tracked in terms of the access to that state is tracked. So if it's an unsafe access, it won't be allowed. Uh, it'll be denied. Yes. So here, here instead of sending a message explicitly, you sharing allowing to share a state, which you can use as a message. So that's kind of counterintuitive. Um. Precisely, that is not allowed, if I understood correctly. No, that's it's the exact opposite of the opposite you were thinking. So yeah. you coordinate <laughs> the the access to your shared data, and the compiler tracks that you coordinate it correctly. So it does that through uh, aliases or references to that shared state. So Pony knows and can track how many references you have to the shared state and what capabilities they have. Yeah, but that's essentially what it uses. But actors are not supposed to have shared state, so kind of that's to me upside down. Instead of sending well, yeah, no, it, it doesn't have shared state in that sense. <laughs> but how, could, how can to you be more precise? Can you run uh, pony uh, actors in a distributed manner where you cannot share a state directly? You need to send a message. Yes, and distributed, distributed pony is still something that hasn't been uh, built yet. It's currently being built, so the serialization for it has already been done, and I think checked into master. Uh, but that's where the uh, the guarantees for garbage collection, so Pony Garbage Collects Actors, becomes a little bit more uh, complicated. It's got an internal protocol to handle that, and that protocol has been extended for distributed Pony, but it hasn't been implemented yet, so it's still you know researchware as opposed to uh, production-worthy uh, implemented stuff. Uh, it's been proven as uh, something that will work and should work and could work, but no one's actually built it and tested it and said it does work, and there's no mechanical proof, so... So time will tell. It's, it's, it's progressing quite quickly. So um, in six months, maybe I'll have an answer to that question. Um, if, if you're interested in those stuff, I'd highly recommend either joining the Pony Alias or, or pinging Sylvan uh, on the details of that. Um, so fast, cheap, and cheap. Uh, an actor only has 240 bytes of memory overhead. And because the runtime is lock free, um, when an actor has nothing to do, an actor costs you nothing other than that 240 bytes. Uh, that's pretty amazing, and that's far less. What's the typical overhead of a Java object? 
12 bytes or in memory. There's, there's, there's other things associated with the Java object, not just that, right? So is it approaching 240 bytes? I, don't think so. I think Erlang's somewhere around 300 and odd, 350 bytes. So that's, that's not a lot of overhead. And, and again, if it's not consuming or doing anything, it's not consuming any resources other than that memory. Um, how cheap are these? Um, so I keep on saying they're fast and they're cheap, but uh, I feel like I need to prove it in some way. Um, so they're zero copy. Uh, the reference capabilities allows uh, the compiler to actually uh, use reference passing rather than copying the messages. So in the Erlang case, it's, it's directly copy-based, but in, in this case it isn't. Uh, it's reference-based. Um, if you jump into the actual message queue pushing in an actor, you can see that it's got a single atomic exchange and atomic store operation. It'll also detect when, um, when a queue is empty. Um, so it's you know, lock free. Um, popping a message off a queue is also cheap, so we got an atomic load. And we have a, that's it. So on x86, this will compile down into a, uh, I've lost track of myself now. Anyway, zero copy messages. Um, the re reference capability is really what drives this. Um, and that's pretty cool. So in terms of scheduler threads, the scheduler layer is much the same as um, Erlang. So scheduler per core would be a typical layer. You can tune that, and you can tune the yielding, yielding strategy. Um, kernel threads are typically pinned to core. It's SPMC in, so single producer, single consumer. Um, and you got a message queue for quiescence detection in the scheduler, so Pony can detect when there's no more message active on an actor, and when there's, uh, it's impossible to have a future message ever queued onto the actor, it knows that it's safe to clear and garbage collect that actor. So that's that quiescence uh, detection uh, mechanism is the real genius inside Pony. You don't have to manage uh, references to actors. You can just let them go out of context, and they will be garbage collected for you. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, we have an SPMC queue. Um, it's unbounded and non-intrusive, which is highly controversial. There is a CAS loop to pop an actor off the queue. Um, that's about, uh, so it's a work staining scheduler. Um, there is message bas uh, batching for performance reasons, amortize uh, cost. And I'll skip that. And quiescence detection. So the quiescence detection protocol um, is IO aware. So uh, for example, in that ping pong example, I think we've run out of time. But if I skip ahead, and let's not bother with the quiz, but if I have uh, this construction. So I have an actor with uh, a loop, and it will loop forever. This is a tail recursive uh, behavior, so the behavior is calling itself tail recursively, and that will continuously run forever. But uh, I have this other behavior called kill, and if I set this alive variable to false, then the match on alive will always return false, and clearly no other loop call will ever get scheduled to run. So the compiler can uh, know to um, uh, cut the program. So although it doesn't deadlock and there's no data races, you can still easily write code that live locks or effectively blocks the, uh, an actor uh, like this. So in this example, we're creating an actor and we're calling a kill operation. So if that wasn't implemented tail recursively, you call kill and the loop never gets a chance to run. If you call the loop first, it would loop forever and kill will never get a chance to run and get scheduled. So you can, it's still not perfect. You can still live lock by writing stupid code. Uh, yes, I guess. But um, so if you write tail recursive behaviors, uh, and this all works because we've got causal message passing in Pony. And that's a, a, sorry, a big difference from, um, uh, that's kind of the big difference from Erlang or other systems, is that causal messaging guarantee just simplifies your life no end. That's the cause of most of the data races I've written in Erlang in production systems, is when I think I've sent a message A at time A, but actually arrived at time B in an order that I wasn't expecting. And suddenly I'm into a, uh, a couple of days worth of debugging and fixing and tearing architectures apart. Uh, to actually recombine things uh, into a more sensible way. It just doesn't happen in Pony. You write what you think should happen, and because it's causally message-based, it actually just happens in that way, exactly as you've specified it. It's like amazingly powerful and releasing um, when you're writing production code. 
Um, it's kind of cool. So, uh, I'm going to skip this one because it was just a, a, a benchmark, but I'm going to try and get uh, the demo in. So I'm going to SSH. I have been porting Pony to MIPS, which does now uh, work. SSH, uh, that's SSH in. So I'm going to SSH into a MIPS device, which hopefully is still running here. And the password. And you can see we're running on a 512 megahertz uh, MIPS device. It's got 32 megabytes of flash, which is not enough to store Pony, Clang, or anything else. Um, and, uh, and you can ask questions while I'm doing this. Any more questions? Uh, yes, no? Uh, one, one remark to the causal messaging. That's very nice. Um, That's wonderful. Unfortunately, once you go distributed, you will notice that the state needed to track causality will scale with the number of actors uh, in your system. Actors mu don't need to be actors, could be schedulers, but still, uh, that will be limiting. It will be limiting, but it's a better limiting factor than having to deal with all the race conditions that are going to stop you getting to that point of, of hitting that limiting factor. Uh, the, the nice... Uh, the nice thing for me is just not having to write all of that defensive uh, code to schedule operations correctly, uh, which takes a very simple state machine and creates a very complex implementation very quickly. Uh, you avoid that with causal messaging, and you, you end up writing this natural code. That was a more surprising result than everything else that I'd come to adopt Pony for and come to love it for. Uh, reference capability you come to love because of the performance guarantees it gives you. Causal messaging really comes into play in terms of writing simpler code for production and not having to lie awake at night worrying that your systems are going to go down because you wrote a nice juicy race condition uh, into a state machine somewhere. Um, but um, let's just run the Pony compiler on something I created earlier. And I could actually implement the same program while that's running on the 512 megahertz device, but it's pretty close. I was hoping to have it actually working into a slightly different talk today, but I'm uh, down in the depths of LLVM, machine code, target generation issues. Um, all of the runtime and compiler tests do pass on MIPS now, so the port is fairly close to being uh, uh, contributed back into Pony and merged to master, but we're just not quite there yet. It wasn't ready in time for, for today. Um, any other questions? That's just going to keep on running. Oh, there you go. Pony compiler is running. And I did something stupid, so... <laughs> <sighs> uh, we can do that outside. Any other questions? Roland? Uh, this time is really a question. Um, so you said uh, actors are composable con co concurrency, yeah. which is true to a degree. Uh, at it's true intuitively. You break down your problem, makes it make it simpler into smaller problems, mm. and so on. Um, there is a problem that is caused by this and that is not easily fixed, and that is the collaboration between multiple actors yep. uh, and making sure that they don't run into logical deadlocks or live locks or that their <laughs> protocols work in general. Yep. Um, how are things looking um, in terms of trying to formalize that? For example, you're looking at uh, se session types or anything like that? Um. I don't know what active work there is on that yet. I think it's going to be part of what comes with distributed pony. Um, I don't know of any active projects looking at protocols on top of pony, but I do know distributed pony will introduce some system actors to help with that. Uh, what state that's in, I haven't been checking up on. Um, but yes, it's a known problem, and it's going to be handled in some way. There's other issues with the current implementation, for example, because uh, queues and pony are unbounded. Um, that's uh, both neither a good nor a bad thing, but clearly unbounded queues have caused us a lot of uh, problems in production systems, so that's uh, something that needs to be resolved in some way that will likely introduce some degree of scheduler priority into the runtime to contend with that and what shape that takes. I think Sylvan did a talk at QCon or Microsoft Research with some details on the ideas that might go into that. So that's a known issue, but the, the answer to what that means for Pony and the Pony scheduler and runtime hasn't been decided yet, but it is actively being uh, researched. Other questions? Anyone down the back? Hopefully I um, didn't bore you. Um, I'm afraid that we are running out of time. So, um, awesome. But <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think it's a good idea, well, after having lunch, to go to directly to you and make more questions, because I think that 
that there will sure. be some some people that still have some some questions to make, right? Anyone has any questions? Uh, if I'm if here you for want, the next I mean two days. We may have time for one more Just question or nope. Thank you very much for okay, your time. Okay, well, thank you.